Hi everyone, thanks for having me here, it's great. Uh, hopefully that's not a new feature of the muter that when you get to the wrong data it starts firing off the fire alarm. Or maybe it was when Jason showed, I don't know, it was one or the other. But all good. So, uh, team, I am uh, Dave Abrahams and I support all of the data teams and data capability at IAG. Um, and so I'm just going to take a half an hour or so just to walk us through some of the story of, of how we've been changing uh, our, our data within IAG and on the transformation journey there and also where we've been using uh, things like Amuda. So let me just skip through a few slides to get to this one here. So IAG, we are a large general insurance organisation that spans across both New Zealand and Australia. We've got about 100 years of history in our organisation, uh, about 13,000 employees, um, and we've, we've grown significantly over many years through lots of merger and acquisition. And so we're proud to be able to operate some of Australia and New Zealand's uh, well-recognised brands like NRMA, CGU, uh, in New Zealand, AMI, State, as well as some of our new brands like the Roland uh, brand for the younger generation. Um, and so our strategy, well, so first of all, our purpose is really um, to help make the world a safer place. And to do that, our strategy is really these four key elements, right? So it's about growing with our customers, building better businesses, um, creating value through digital and managing our risks. And for us in the data and technology and analytics space, the key one for us is really about creating value through digital. And how that plays out for us is in these four priorities. So our priority number one is really in the core transformation of our insurance platforms. So that's our policy systems, claim systems, pricing systems. As I said, we've grown through lots of merger and acquisition, so we have multiple versions of these systems. We have 13 different policy systems, 12 or 10 different you know, claim systems, lots of HR systems, finance systems, all those things need to be rationalised down and we need to really simplify and modernise that core technology stack, which is something that we're working on and we're working on optimising, accelerating that for our personalised direct business so that they can adopt that platform and move forward rapidly into becoming a more digital organisation. Second is really around our commercial business. And this is the business that deals a lot with brokers and partners and so we're making it easier for those those partners and brokers to be able to do business with us. And really for me that's about unlocking the data from all those silo you know, heritage uh, applications and systems and making that data much more accessible to drive value into those relationships. Third is really around really making our organisation an efficient lean insurance business and automating as much as we possibly can where we can and really making it easier for us to be you know, ready for the future state and really fit for whatever you know, changes have to happen and wherever we need to go in the future. And fourth and, and finally is really around how we digitise our organisation for our customers. And it's in those small, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of, of quick, innovative improvements that we can make to really accelerate the way that we provide a better experience to our customers. But overall, what this really is doing and all this work that we've, that we've got on and massive transformation that we're doing is really creating an improved data set for our organisation. In fact, where IAG is now headed is that we, we have the most comprehensive data set we've ever had in our organisation. And we all know that complete, accurate and timely information is fundamental to enabling digital processes. In fact, it is the difference between us being able to automate a process instantly or having to introduce manual intervention and manual work that needs to be done to then you know, get value from that data. And that's kind of the boat that we're stuck in today, where we're now trying to move away from and move into that next space. So, where are we? I just want to step back for a minute and just talk about some trends that are happening more broadly to the industry. And there's these kind of four key trends that I just want to focus on. And they are in, if we think about firstly the, the trends that are happening in the next five years. So what we're talking about there is, the, is, is sensors and you know, data portability, right? People being able to take data from one organisation and easily move it to another organisation. And what those trends are really driving is an explosion in exponential growth of data. And there's lots of you know, increase in data happening that we all as organisations need to deal with. Now, if we then flip back 
to the, to the short-term uh, trends that are impacting us, they're really about the activation of data and how we get value from data. So how do we leverage and embed AI into everything that we do and really scale AI capability? And then, of course, how do we tailor all of that down to the individual and really make the experience for each person quite unique and quite personalised? Now, for us, you know, there's an explosion of, uh, of data coming from all areas, particularly in the world of sensors. And I just want to think about it from um, you know, the, the financial services industry, particularly banking and payments. Because if we step back for a second and just think what happened when the pandemic hit, right? When, when we went into the pandemic, basically cash was eliminated overnight. It was taken out of our, our, our society. And what happened was there was a massive explosion of census. So everybody started to adopt their digital wallet and all payments were contactless. And everybody was tap and go and using census to do things. So for me, you know, now what that means is, you know, on my, on my kind of daily routine, I'm now tapping on at the train station to catch the train and then tapping off when I get into the city. I'm then going buying my coffee, tapping on. I'm going and, you know, paying for my lunch. Another tap, another contactless payment. And what does this mean? So if you think about the banking industry and, and the data that they had prior to the pandemic, they were seeing a few transactions, maybe one or two transactions from me a week, where I was withdrawing money from the ATM and then going and doing what I needed to do. Now, all of a sudden, they're seeing a transaction, multiple transactions for me on a daily basis that are sending them all this data about who I am. And that's happening for all of us. So there's an exponential increase of millions of transactions now flowing into the bank, which is creating a different perspective of how they now understand me as a customer. But they're now able to use that data. And what organisations are now doing with this, this exponential increase in information is really starting to shift from having those transactional style relationships and interactions with customers. So, you know, helping customers achieve a task. And in, the, in our business, that's, you know, get a quote, pay your renewal, lodge a claim, to shift to a more relational interaction. And the banks are doing a great job of this with this increased data by saying, well, now we're seeing all these transactions. A, we can help you better understand where you're spending your money. We can auto classify those payments into things that you're spending on, in, in, on entertainment, things that you're spending on groceries, things you're spending on utilities, whatever. And not only can we auto classify that data for you instantly, we can also start to help provide capabilities like managing your budget, managing your finances. We can now start to predict that over the next month, this is your payment pattern. Over the next six months, this is your payment pattern. And this is the things that you'll need to do to start to save money or achieve your financial goals. And that's all happening for me in an instant, in an automated way. That's the type of capability we're now talking about that's enabled by these banks and financial services companies as the, the sensors have now started to take over and data is flowing in from everywhere. And so I think, whilst that's not necessarily the, the case directly in the insurance industry, and that's, that hasn't happened to us yet because there's still a fair bit of manual process, we're expecting that to happen in the near future. And so we're getting ourselves ready for that. If we just move on to the next slide here, really, this is, this is kind of um, the story of our data journey in IAG. And like I said, uh, you know, we've grown significantly over many years through lots of merger and acquisition. We've got systems everywhere. In fact, for those of us that have worked with IRG or know IRG or been part of our, our um, you know, part of the, the transformation journey, we'll probably have the view that IRG has just about one of every technology. And in fact, not only one of every technology, but every single version of that technology as well. And so it's really, really complex. And so what we've been, so the first part of our journey was really about just gathering all that data from across many, many systems across our entire organisation and really bringing that together into a single data platform. Bringing that together in a single data platform and being able to harmonise and curate that data to make it as accessible as possible. And so not only was that a journey of you know, improving and, and kind of uplifting our technology capability, but it was also a journey of really uplifting our people capability, really improving you know, the skills uh, and, and you know, the process that our people were using. Transitioning people from being analysts that might have been using a lot of Excel to deliver you know, insights and capability and manually stitch data together 
to inform the organisation, to becoming more engineers and to automate the process of, of delivering data to the organisation. And so that was the kind of foundational sort of transformation that we needed to go on. That was our original strategy was to really uplift and, and build those foundations. And that started to, once we had that single um, data platform and really that single source of truth, that enabled us to then start to move into the world of building data products and move away from solving kind of, um, you know, very specialised and very uh, singular use cases with data to now building data products that could solve multiple use cases. And so the next evolution of our strategy is really about, um, you know, activation. Really about using data to create value and activating it to drive some business, business capability, some value. And to do that, we needed to be able to build scale. And to, do, and to really start to get that scale happening, we needed to really become more efficient at these six shifts and drive those on top of our um, data platform. And I'm just going to touch on a couple. So data engineering, for us, that really means adopting modern engineering practices and tooling and data capability, but mostly leveraging cloud innovation. So starting to use platforms like BigQuery, Vertex AI, that type of capability that can really accelerate and scale the foundations of our data work. Another one is in data governance. Now, while we have a strong data governance team, lots of frameworks, standards, the process of data governance within IIG was highly manual. And it ended up with people doing most of the work. And of course, that doesn't scale very well. So data governance became the bottleneck um, of, of most programs, was on the critical path of all these programs. And so you know, our, our goal here was A, to federate data governance and expand that out, and create data ownership, data stewardship, and get more of our organization on board and involved in the process of you know, verifying data and, and making data uh, usable for, for certain use cases, but also introducing automation and using technology to automate that. And, and the key here was that um, Amuta was quite a, a strategic enabler of this automation process. Another area I want to touch on is really in uh, the data partnership shift. So for us, you know, we have a lot of data. We collect a lot of first party information from our customers about you know, their, their policies and, and claims and you know, all of our supply chain processes and, and whatnot. But we also enrich data, so we buy a lot of data from third party brokers and whatnot. But one of the key areas that we focused uh, heavily on and, and had a lot of success in is really leveraging our ventures arm. So we have a ventures uh, business within IAG that looks to uh, invest in early stage startups. And what we're, what we're working closely with them in is where can we find early stage startups that are producing the next evolution of insurance data? Where can we go and invest in those organisations to become part of that journey and become part of that story and get access to that future uh, you know, insurance information. And for example, that could be investing in a drone startup that's looking at how they can assess buildings using, using drone technology. Or another example is uh, a company, a startup based in the US called Aturo that uh, have AI capability to translate satellite imaging of properties into data attributes. And so we can then use those data attributes to provide a more convenient customer experience uh, for our customers that are getting quotes on their properties because we already know the rooftop, we already know the distance to bushland, we already start to bring more information into that process and make it easier for them and also drive a better risk outcome so that they're not underinsured. So they're the kind of shifts that we've been focused on making as, as part of our um, next evolution of our data journey. I just want to take a second to, to talk about data products. And so, like I said, what we've, what we've really started to move away from is, you know, those kind of point solutions of providing data for a certain specific use case to how do we build data products that now can service multiple use cases across our organisation. And so we, we basically spent a lot of time in the customer domain. And when we thought about it, we kind of looked across our insurance, uh, you know, data domains and you know, we, we, we're an insurance business, so we capture data based on things like policies, claims, pricing, supply chain, and that's how we organise data within our organisation. And that means a lot to us, but it doesn't mean a lot to our customers. And so what we really wanted to do was extract all of the things about customers 
and who they are from those data sets and organise that in a way that really um, provided a better view of what our, who our customers were and what they valued and what they wanted to protect and what was important to them. And so we created what we know, what we call a single view of everything. But it's basically a single view of customer, single view of business, single view of asset, anything that's a real life entity that is important and relates to our, to our customers. But what this has provided is a, a, a data product that now can be used for multiple purpose. It can be used for analytic, predictive capability to work out you know, what's our retention on particular customer segments. It can be looked at working out what's the next best action for a particular customer. It can also uh, work out and, and understand you know, tenure, um, you know, uh, the depth of, of relationship we have with a customer, uh, and also, of course, what, how we can personalise the experience and personalise the messaging for each individual customer. And that's provided a new capability for us to really power and drive a lot of our digital uh, interactions with customers. And a very simple example out of that process is just being able to take away some of the burden of answering you know, the, the multitude of questions we ask customers when they're trying to get a quote with us. And for example, we not, when, when customers are coming in asking to get a quote on a property with us, we ask them all about their property. You know, tell us about uh, what type of, when was the house constructed, what type of construction material is it, what type of roof have you got, what's the pitch of the roof, how far is it, and these are things that the customers just don't know. And when we look at our web analytics, we can see a huge dropout rate. Customers are just leaving at that point. And, and they're leaving to call us up and say, I don't know all these things, you're just going to have to help us out. So we're driving traffic away from our digital platform, which we want to you know, keep people in and, and, and you leverage because it's, it's the most efficient way for us to, to provide quotes to our customers. And then we're driving them into our assisted channel and onto the phones, which is not helpful. So by us re, you know, building this single view of property and being able to pipe that data back into our digital channel and pre-fill those questions, not only can we get customers to help us validate that, that data and, and improve that data with each cycle that is going around our organisation, but also we're able to reduce the time it takes for a customer to actually get a quote. So they're answering less questions and wasting le less time trying to get a quote with us, which is much better. So, just wanted to walk us through a bit of a simplified uh, flow here of, of uh, the data and how Amuta is helping uh, improve and govern the usage of this information. And when you think about it, data is flowing obviously from our customers, you know, getting a quote or, or you know, lodging a claim into our transactional systems. It's then flowing through our data platforms and into the data product. And there, that's when we start to apply multiple layers of, of capability to really um, build out that, that automated data governance process. And that includes things like automated data classification using ML and AI to, to interrogate all of our data sets and figure out what's sensitive, what's PII, what's um, you know, uh, IP to the, to the organisation like financial data and shouldn't be made available. And, th and then, then we can store that, that detail in our data catalogue and provide that available to uh, you know, data stewards, data owners to then be able to add to that additional metadata and or you know, verify and approve if this is the right, um, the right setting, the right information that they, that they want uh, to make available. And then of course across that we've got a muter with our automated policies that are basically codifying our data governance framework and our data governance standards. And so we're codifying our privacy standard into a muter to say well, by default, we don't want people having access to PII, to personally identifiable information. And we'll only allow people access via exception and where they need that. Because in most cases, that's not necessary. Or another example is, how do we codify our retention and disposition standard into a policy that is applying the right length of history that's being made available to a customer? So we can codify that standard and by default, we know, looking at a lot of the queries that our, that our, our um, employees and our you know, data engineers and our data people are making, is roughly for the, they're looking at data over the last 12 months. There's not that many of our, of our organisation really looking back 10 years. Yes, maybe the pricing team or the actuaries are looking from a reserving perspective to do modelling. They're looking back over 10 years. But for 80% of all, all data requests, 
They're only looking at data over the last 12 months. So we need to rethink the posture around our um, you know, retention and disposition and say, why, why are we allowing data, uh, people access to data further back than 12 months? Why, why aren't we by default just cutting it off as a new policy in our, in our um, Amuta framework that's just basically restricting access to data further back? And that's a much smarter and much easier way for us to think about implementing you know, the default standards that we need to to really make sure that our data is quite protected and not getting you know, used or, or accessed inappropriately by people that are just getting too much. They're just being over allocated from an access perspective. So where's the future taking us? Like I said, you know, for us, what we're really here and our purpose is really about making your world a safer place. And of course, where that really plays out for us is when, you know, an event has occurred, there's a natural disaster, an incident, and we're there to get you back on your feet and help you recover to the where you were before that occurred. But obviously with, you know, the world becoming more and more connected, and as we're starting to shift more towards a sensor-driven world with sensors in cars, homes, personal devices, we're now able to change the, 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 the way that we look at getting people back and making them resilient away from just supporting them when the incidents occurred to actually being able to start to be preventative and help avoid those incidents in the first place and start to think about, you know, how can we better inform our customers when they are doing something or they're in an environment or their, their house is becoming a part of a, 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 an unsafe kind of situation. And how can we encourage them to do things and, and shift their behaviour towards being more uh, safer in those environments? And that might be simple things like just cleaning the gutters in your house or removing you know, debris that's, that's, that's sort of sitting around your home that could be part of a bush, could start to be um, you know, fuel for a bushfire. So how do we help our customers understand that and be a bit more proactive, a bit more predictive? Of course, um, you know, when, when data's involved, we can definitely intervene and we can definitely see that behaviour because we become more connected with them. In fact, we move from having those customer interactions that might be once or twice a year when we you know, renew our policy or make a claim to now being connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all, always on you know, with a data stream. And from that perspective, we can start to think about, well, how do we now nudge the behaviour of our customers to do safer things? And as, to give you an example, a very simple example, our innovation team built a telematics capability that we put into our customers' vehicles. And with that telematics um, device, we could detect when an incident had occurred. And not only could we detect when an incident occurred, but we could detect the severity of that incident. So we could, if it was a, a severe crash, we could try and contact the customer if we didn't hear from them. We could alert emergency services and have emergency services automatically on site to help them. And if it wasn't a significant incident, and it was just a minor incident, we could still contact them, but we can contact them and help them walk through the claims process and make it easier for them at that point when you know, things are going on, it's a bit hard to know what to do, you're a bit sort of phrased, um, and someone's, you know, you've had an accident with another party that's yelling at you because you've damaged their new car and we can help you know, guide them through that and say, look, everything's gonna be okay, we're insured, we're gonna make sure we get your car repaired, and, get you back to where you were, and even just dealing with tow truck drivers. I don't know if anyone's had a crash, but tow truck drivers are an industry in themselves and can be quite hard to, uh, or quite influential in the way that they uh, try to encourage you to come back to their particular repair shop. So we can be there with the customer at the scene of the incident and really walk them through that, those steps of how they get um, to, to you know, a situation where they're back on their feet and they're back to, to where they were. So. With this, the key, just cycling back, the key for us is really in, in how do we maximise the value that we're getting from our data. And for us, the ultimate there is really how we leverage uh, AI and innovation to really do that. And I just want to touch on this because back to our you know, single view of everything in our, in our customer 360, one of the uh, kind of flywheel effects that we're seeing here is really because we are creating that deeper understanding of every single customer with our data, we're then able to strengthen those relationships and have a better conversation and more personalised interaction and provide a more convenient experience for our customers, which then 
in cycle drives, more understanding, better relationship, and so on and so on. And, you know, I think the, the, the key to this future, which actually Matt was mentioning earlier in, the, in his session, the key to this future is that what we're really saying is that it's a bit of a step beyond just the core of, you know, transactional systems. It's in, it is in the world and the rise of data applications. And it is where data is no longer that static data store used for just analysis and insight, but actually it is the dynamic brain and, and central nervous system of, of our applications. And we all know, and we've all seen, the possibilities of AI. Things that we never thought five years ago were possible have now become reality. And for organisations like us at IAG, the first wave of AI and ML implementations for us were being, have been very, um, you know, uh, point solutions. They've been about how do we create value by lowering the cost of this process? And that might be, you know, automatically detecting the type of damage a vehicle's had and whether it should be written off or whether it's repairable or, or, or automating, you know, who's at fault in a claim process. But for the most part, really, that's the same work that we've always done. Yes, we've lowered the cost of that actual process, but it's pretty much the same um, type of work and the same process that we've always been doing. The next wave of AI that we're looking at where we're really headed is actually reinventing those processes and reinventing the entire value proposition and really changing that innovation to system level innovation and system level disruption. We know that using AI and AI capability, we're able to really rewrite the value proposition and really change the way that we manage and look at risk. And so for me, the key success factor is really in that um, complete end-to-end, -end, automated, tailored experience that is simple and easy to execute for each of our individual customers. And that's where we're, that's where we're headed. So I think that's it. Try to keep it quick. I know I'm between us and going and networking some more and having some drinks. Uh, happy to take questions, by the way, or go and grab a drink. Can we have a massive round of applause, please? <laughs>